Okay, great. So if you can turn back toward me now. Let me just have a, a, one or two of you just to share your list with us. A master list. One of the lists that's been compiled, okay? Okay. Great, thank you. Um, you got uh, obviously Bible study, prayer, fasting, uh, listening to music and or singing along with music, journaling, reminiscing, sleeping and resting, uh, doing devotional type workbooks, taking new steps of faith, and one another relationships embracing specific challenges. Excellent, great. Anyone else? Yes. Excellent. Great. Okay. So uh, almost everything that was just listed, and I'm sure most of you, your list looks something like that, but almost everything that was just listed is categorized as a spiritual discipline. It's just a matter if it's really mentioned specifically or it's underneath a larger category. But what I want you to see is from the very beginning of this time together is you've already been practicing the spiritual disciplines. Whether you called them that or not, you've been doing it. Because anything that helps you to grow spiritually, that helps you to become more like Jesus, all of these activities, all of these skills that we learn, that we keep doing over and over again, all of these are leading us in our lives to have character change. And that character change helps us to become more like Jesus. So we're being formed into Christ through the spiritual disciplines. Amen. Now the point of this class is for us to understand the spiritual disciplines a little more specifically for really two reasons. And I want you to understand both of these. Both are very important. First, for you. Okay, the, the more you can understand spiritual formation, character change, and the spiritual disciplines, the more you're going to help yourself grow. Right. But then secondly, for other people. This will really help other people to grow as well. And I think one of the things we have to realize in our spiritual walk, and especially as we work with churches and work with other people, is that the, the goal of helping people in studying the Bible with them and, and helping them to find God is the goal is not baptism. Okay? That's the beginning of the journey. That's the start. The goal is to help people, and you might think, well, to get to heaven, but there's even a goal before that. And that is to help Christ be formed in them in the here and now. And that's the goal. The goal is spiritual maturity. Paul said, I want to present everyone mature in Christ. Everyone. And so that is the goal. And that's really what spiritual formation and the spiritual disciplines that's what it's all about, is helping people to become more like Christ. So this is a class in which we're going to be talking about the process of spiritual formation, forming Christ in other people. Spiritual formation is the process of becoming more like Jesus. We do this through the spiritual disciplines. In, the, in spiritual formation, a person practices spiritual disciplines that focus the individual on Jesus and then the individual becomes more like Jesus through practicing the spiritual disciplines. Henry Nouwen, and I'm going to quote his, uh, I'm going to say his name quite a bit and quote from him quite a bit. He is a great devotional writer. He's written uh, numerous, numerous books. Um, one of the reasons that I 
know of Nowlin and why I quote him so much is I basically read all of his books because uh, one of the guys, he was a spiritual mentor for a number of people and it just so happens that one of my professors, Michael Christensen, was mentored by Henry Nowlin. And so, in the, actually this book that you see on the screen here about spiritual formation, Michael Christensen helped edit this book after Henry Nowlin passed away. And so it's really through Michael, Michael Christensen that I know the works of Henry Nowlin, and I've gone back and I've, re I've read most of his works, but um, it's great to sort of be that, that close to uh, this writer, and more like one step away from this writer through my professor, Michael Christensen. But I'll quote him quite often, and I invite you to read his books. It's, he, he's written some amazing devotional books. Um, however, you know, I would, I would say you might not want to purchase them for this simple fact. They're very thin and easy to read, but they're also expensive. And so find them in a library. You can read them in a day or two. Make quotes from them. Return them to the library, and you'll save yourself a lot of money that way. Okay? Or you can borrow them from me. No, that, that might not work. Spiritual formation, this is Henry Nowlin. Spiritual formation, I have come to believe, is not about steps or stages on the way to perfection. It's about the movements from the mind to the heart through prayer in its many forms that reunite us with God, each other, and our truest selves. So spiritual formation is about being reunited with God. He also says this in a really great book, Can You Drink the Cup? It says, we need some very concrete spiritual disciplines to help us fully appropriate and internalize our joys and sorrows and find in them our unique way to spiritual freedom. Now, sometimes we might think of the spiritual disciplines as practicing them in a legalistic way. We've talked about Bible study, prayer, uh, discipling, these kind of things. But really, when you practice the spiritual disciplines in the right way, they're not legalistic at all. They actually lead to spiritual freedom. But you have to want it. That's, that's the key. It's your own motivation and your heart and your approach to the spiritual disciplines. But if you approach them in the right way and you're properly motivated in the spiritual disciplines, they'll actually help you to experience spiritual freedom and to be drawn to God to become more like Christ. But you know, anything that we do in life and we want to get better at it, we have to practice in order to get there. I mean, if you want to play guitar and play well, you've got to spend the hours practicing the basic chords. If you want to play lead guitar, then you have to do the riffs. If you want to, do it, if you want to be great at a sport, you have to spend the time on the fundamentals, the basic skills. When baseball comes back into session every year, there is spring training. And the professionals get out there and they, they just do grounder after grounder after grounder. They go through double plays. They, they try to run from first to second and hit the base just right. And they practice the fundamentals. And no matter how many years they play, they come out every spring and they go through the fundamentals all over again. I just came back from, from Nigeria. I was in uh, Lagos and Ibadan, and I had a great time there. I was gone for like 11 days, and I uh, got, uh, got to do a lot of teaching, and I taught some of this material while I was there. Um, you know, in, in Nigeria, they love football. I mean, real football, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I saw this guy. This was the craziest thing. And if you've ever been to Lagos, the traffic in Lagos is unbelievable. I mean, riding around in it is, you, you would think you were in a video game, yeah, because it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, but there was a guy riding down the street, uh, coming into traffic, okay, on the side of the street, coming into traffic. He was riding on his bicycle, and he was balancing a soccer ball on his head as he was riding his bicycle. Wow. And it, it, we just we just stared at him. I wish I'd had time to take his picture. It was the most amazing thing. But he was practicing that skill, riding his bike with that soccer ball on his head. Now, anything you want to do in life and do it well, whether it's fly a plane or, or be a doctor or be an athlete or be a musician, 
you have to practice. They're just skills that you have to do. And it's really no different in living a spiritual life. The difference is the motivation and the heart behind it. And so as we approach Bible study and prayer and fasting and meditation and worship and the one another relationships and service and some of these spiritual disciplines that we're going to be talking about over the next three days, we can approach them in a legalistic way and not get much out of it. Or we can approach them with our heart, understanding as I practice these, I'm becoming more like Jesus. And we'll get much out of it, and we will become more like Jesus. We'll see spiritual formation happening, this process happening, through practicing the spiritual disciplines. Now it also says, the disciplines focus our eyes on the road we are traveling and help us to move forward step by step to our goal. We would encounter great obstacles and splendid views, long, dry deserts, and also freshwater lakes surrounded by shadow-rich trees. We have to fight against those who try to attack and rob us. We also will make wonderful friends. We will often wonder if we will ever make it, but one day we will see coming to us the one who has been waiting for us from all eternity to welcome us home. And that's the ultimate goal. But as we're heading toward that goal to be met by Jesus, we try every day to become a little more like him. And that's where spiritual formation and the spiritual disciplines help. Another thing, another way that I like to approach spiritual formation is I like to call it spiritual personal development. I'm sure most of us have heard about personal development. You might have taken some personal development courses or you might have gone to the bookstore, the library, and read some self-help books. Okay, and it's, it's a huge market these days. You can go to, into Barnes & Noble and there's shelves and shelves of self-help books. And actually, I really like self-help books. Not all of them, but some of them. All right. Some of them are really good. How many of you read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Okay, everyone here should read that book. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's, it's, it's a fantastic book. And I encourage you to read books like that. That's personal development. You're trying to work on yourself, work on your character, work on your life skills. Um, you know, how many of you uh, know who Dr. Phil is? Seen him on television? Yeah. There, Dr. Phil actually has a great book. It's called Life Strategies. Now, you might think, well, I would never read anything that Dr. Phil wrote, okay? It's just not on my radar. But let me tell you, I thought that until I picked up this book and I read this book, and it's amazing. I mean, it's life strategy, some great stuff. It'll help you work on yourself, teach you some life skills. And, um, but I call spiritual formation spiritual personal development. Spiritual because that's where we're starting. We're starting with the spiritual aspect. Psalm 42, 1 and 2, As a deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. That's what we want. We want to thirst for God. And this thirsting for God is all about spiritual growth, trying to be formed into the image of Christ. Have you ever been really, really thirsty? Can you understand the only thing that's going to quench that thirst is something liquid. If you've been spiritually thirsty, the only thing that'll quench that is God. And so we need to have that type of thirst for God. But if we have that type of thirst for God, then we're going to get into the word and prayer and relationships and serving others and worship and these types of things. And it all is integrated, all works together. The more we practice these things with the right heart, the more we become like Jesus, then the more we enjoy practicing these things and we go back and we do it a little bit more, get a little more deeper in it, and then we become a little more like Jesus and that process is what helps form Christ in our lives. But it's that idea of focusing on the spiritual. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. 
And so we look at a verse like this and we have to say, you know, we don't want to be worldly. We want to be spiritual. And Paul is saying here, you know, I, 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 I'm giving, I have to give you milk. I want to give you solid food. And what, what he's saying there is I, I want to give you the word because the word's going to help you to be more spiritual. Yeah. But you've got you to want it yourselves. Yeah. And a big part of spiritual formation is you wanting it, you desiring it, you having a thirst for God. Yeah. And if you do, then you will get in and practice the spiritual disciplines. Another way of seeing this is spiritual growth must be intentional. Yes, absolutely. Come on. I hope you get that. Spiritual growth must be intentional, as any kind of growth in life. But if you're going to grow spiritually, you've got to make a decision that I want to grow in this area of my life. And then you're intentional about it by practicing the spiritual disciplines with the right heart. Engaging the heart as you do it. And so I want to grow to become more like Jesus. Therefore, I'm going to get in the Gospels and read about Jesus. And I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I'm going to ask God to change the things in my life and in my heart that aren't like Jesus. And I'm going to go to people in the fellowship and in the body of Christ. And I'm going to find those people that I feel like are like Jesus. And they're like Jesus in a way that I'm not. And I'm going to study them. And I'm going to learn from them. And some of them, I'm going to ask them if they will get with me. And they will help me out in this area of my life where I want to grow to become more like Jesus. But you see, all of that is intentional. It's things that you're doing to try to become like Jesus. And then God works through that in a beautiful way. His spirit works through you making that decision and then following through on the plan. And so as we go through the spiritual disciplines that will help us to become more like Jesus, we see that we're, we need to be intentional as we practice the spiritual disciplines. The second category, spiritual personal development, is the idea of personal. Because the fact is, is that all of us grow differently in our spiritual lives. No two people grow in exactly the same way. Now, this is true of you. And you're thinking about yourself and your own personal growth. But it's also true of the people you're going to be working with. And that's really important. Because we need to realize that we cannot make cookie cutter disciples. You know what I'm talking about? And we're just going to try to put them through this factory, this press. And they're all going to come out looking the same on the other side. It does not work. That factory is going to break down at some point. Because no two people are exactly alike. And so the way that they grow, it's, they're, it's all going to be different for them. Yeah. Some people are really motivated through Bible study. And that's what, that's what puts the, the wind in their sails spiritually. For other people, it's prayer. And you ask them, you know, what are you, you going to do to work on your life to make some changes? Well, I'm going to pray about it. For other people, it might be fasting. It might be meditation. For some people, it's worship. I mean, they love to get out and they sing praises to God. They love to be with God in nature. They love to connect with God in a way of worship. And for some people, that's how they're going to grow the most. That's how they connect the best with God. You, know, we were, you can just look at different types of people in the church and you can see that they, that they have different things that they emphasize. You know, we were having a, we had a retreat with the, New York staff, the men, we go out every year up to the mountains, the Adirondack Mountains, and we spend some time together up there. And we were sitting around, and we had one of the guys that leads uh, a worship team, and he sort of leads worship when we have um, different big events, that sort of thing. And we had him share a little bit, about 30 minutes on worship and different aspects of worship and that sort of thing. And he said, you know, when it comes to us getting together for public worship, he said, singing is the most important thing we do. Wow. Yeah, I sat there and I thought, really? Singing is the most important thing we do. And I thought, well, what about communion? What about connecting with God through communion? And I'm sure, you know, an evangelist next to me was thinking, well, what about preaching? You know, I'm getting up, I'm, I preach. That maybe that's the most important part. And then there was probably a, an administrator sitting there that was thinking, what about giving? You know, surely giving is the most important part. 
but it all, it, from where you're coming from, they all seem like the most important thing. But the fact is, is that for all of us that are in the room right now, you connect with God in your own way, and it's probably different from the person sitting by you. And I know for me, I connect with God mostly through, or I should say, my, my primary connection with God, the thing that puts the wind in my cells more than anything else is my Bible study. And I love getting in the Word, and I love studying the Bible. And I'll be honest with you, for prayer, prayer for me, I know it's important. I know I'll be talking about it. I know it's something that I need to do. It helps me. I need to be connected with God in that way. But it's a struggle for me. I, I struggle to stop reading my Bible. You know, oops, time's up. I want to go more. And that's the struggle for me is when, you know, trying to push myself away from the Word to get something else done. But for some of you, you're going to connect with people more. It's the one another relationships that keep you going. Uh, for, for all of us, we have to figure out what is that personal aspect of me. And here's, here's a really important thing to realize, okay? And this is another thing. Like I said other, well, a moment ago, spiritual growth is intentional. That's important. This is important as well. As you work on your weaknesses, don't forget to keep working on your strengths. Now, I'm going to say that again as we go through the class. But sometimes what happens in a class like this, we realize, well, I'm strong in Bible study. And I'm not so strong in prayer. I'm strong in worship, but my relationships aren't that strong. So I'm going to leave here and I'm really going to work on prayer. And I'm really going to work on relationships. And we let our Bible study slip a bit. And we let the worship and that connection slip a bit. And what you'll find is, is you'll find you'll get frustrated from that. You'll find, you'll find, ah, oh man, something's wrong here. I'm not connecting the way. Because you let the things that really buoy you in the water the most, you let them go in order to work on these things you're trying to strengthen, these weaknesses you're trying to strengthen. So keep strengthening your strengths as you work on the weaknesses and make them stronger as well. Don't let go of strengthening those strengths. So it's personal, personal uh, aspect of spiritual personal development. Philippians 2, verses, 1, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See the personal aspect there. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So we work on things from a personal point of view. And then the third thing is development. Development. Spiritual, personal development. I like this quote from Dr. Henry Cloud. It says, learning to become an adult is not an easy task. Perhaps becoming an adult while you're already living in an adult body is even harder. And sometimes when we become disciples, we become disciples and we've already got all these things, all these habits that are formed in our lives. And then trying to let go of those habits and learn new things, that's a real challenge. But we, with God's help, we can do it. With God's help, we can change. So look at how Jesus grew. We're going to spend a few moments here on development and how we need to grow in this idea of developing into Jesus. Spiritual, personal development. You guys with me? Yeah. Great. Luke 2, verse 52. This is a verse that I would ask you to memorize. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. This is how Jesus grew. And we want to grow like Jesus, right? We want to grow like Jesus grew. And so I would ask you, if, if you write it on a piece of paper... I would ask you just to draw a line up and down on that paper, a vertical line, and then one across that intersects. So you have quadrants on that paper, okay? So you'll have four spaces. Now, if you're not on a piece of paper, this might be a little more difficult, but it looks something like that. Spiritual quadrants. So you type in something that looks like that uh, on your tablet or your computer. And I want you to think about these four areas right here. 
Because we talk, as we talk about spiritual formation, both for you and the people that you're teaching, it's important that everyone grows in these four areas. These are the four areas that Jesus grew in. So Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with man. And we need to not let any one of these four go. Well, I'm, I'm three out of four, that's good. No, four out of four is good. We want to grow in all four of these areas. And the thing is, we can grow in all four of these areas as we practice the spiritual disciplines, as we focus on becoming more like Christ. All of these areas in our lives can be strengthened or can change if we need to totally change one of them. Now, let me just introduce them very quickly here. You'll understand a little bit more about what they are. Some of them you already get. It's pretty uh, self-explanatory, these, these areas here. Let's start with wisdom. Jesus grew in wisdom. Wisdom is really knowledge, but is a more specific kind of knowledge. Okay, the Greek word is sophia, and it means experiential knowledge. Now, experiential knowledge is also uh, fortified by intellectual knowledge and by learning, okay. by book knowledge. And so as you grow in wisdom, you're learning from your life, you're learning from mistakes that you've made, but you're also studying so that you don't have to make mistakes. You're studying so that you can learn from other people, and you're studying so that you can be prepared for whatever might come your way. And so when you think of wisdom, think of growing both intellectually and experientially, learning, being a good student. And when you look at Jesus, even at an early age, at age 12, when he went to the temple and he was left behind in the temple and he was baffling the uh, religious leaders there, you know, they already noticed that Jesus had a, an astute amount of wisdom in his life. Even though he hadn't experienced much of life, he was already wise beyond his years. And so as you grow in wisdom, this is an area where you're going to focus on learning as much as you can, reading great books, and reading as much as you can. You know, readers are leaders. You can learn a lot from getting in books and reading, but also experiencing life and experiencing uh, and learning from your mistakes and learning from other people's mistakes and experiential uh, knowledge and is wisdom as well. So growing in wisdom, life skills, that's important here as well. Okay, the second category, stature. Jesus grew in stature. He grew, as, as a young boy, he grew into a man. And when you, you know, we, in the Gospels, we don't really have an account of what Jesus looked like or how strong he was, but you do get a sense when Jesus, for example, clears the temple, you do get a sense that, you know, when he took a stand, people noticed. You know, there was something there. You get a sense that when he went to the cross and he endured the pain of the cross, that he had some stamina as he went to the cross and endured that. And so Jesus grew in stature. And for us, you know, we, whether we're looking at Jesus or we're looking at what Paul says about the body being the temple and taking care of the temple of God, we need to take care of ourselves. And that's what this means here. To grow in stature means you take care of yourself. You get the proper amount of sleep. You exercise. You, you, <laughs> you eat the right food. Okay? You take care of your body. Because you've only got one shot at this. And so you try to take care of yourself. And so we grow in wisdom. We grow in stature. Physical growth. Our health. Our nutrition. Sleep. Managing stress in your life. All of these things. Taking care of yourself. This is something that's important. And when we think about spiritual formation, we need to include this in our development. Okay, now, the third one is... And he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God, favor with man, so favor with God. In favor with God, obviously, is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. And so favor with God would include our relationship with God, overcoming sin in our lives, making 
spiritual decisions and learning how to make spiritual decisions. Being able to stand on your own two feet spiritually and, you know, make it through a day, make it through a week, make it through a month without Satan just knocking you all around. And realize, you know, I'm teaching this not just for you. I know some of you are there and you're doing that, but helping other people do that. That they need to be able to stand on their own two feet spiritually and they need to make solid decisions, spiritual decisions, in which they are they're maturing, they're growing. And so we're growing in, our, in favor with God, spiritual growth. And then the last one is favor with man. All right. And I would consider this social growth. Growing in the way that we relate to other people. So it's emotional growth. It's social growth. It's relational growth. We get close to people. We understand people. We uh, are able to communicate with people. And we grow in this area. So wisdom, you can think of that as growing intellectually, growing experientially, growing in lifestyles. Stature is physical growth, taking care of ourselves. Favor with God is spiritual growth. Favor with man is relational growth or emotional growth. Now what I want you to do is I want you to look at these quadrants here and I want you just to take a minute and just give yourself a self-evaluation here. Look at these areas and, and ask yourself, what are, what are what, of these areas, what am I strong in? In each of the four. What am I strong in? And what am I weak in? Where are my weaknesses? So just take a moment and look at that and evaluate yourself. Do a little self-examination right now in each of these areas. Okay, hopefully you've begun to do that. Now, I'm going to give you an assignment. You don't have to do it over the next three days. But I want you to do it sometime over the month, okay? So, let's say July. In the month of July, I want you to really take a look at these quadrants here. And I want you to evaluate your strengths and your weaknesses in each one. And then I want you to match up scriptures that will help you to continue to strengthen your, street, your strengths in each area and to sharpen your weaknesses in each area. So, you know, find some biblical conviction on these topics here and on your strengths and your weaknesses in each area. Okay, so I, I'm not going to, you know, over the next three days, I don't ask you to do that, but I do ask you to spend at least 30 minutes just sitting down and really meditating on this and taking a look at this. And as I mentioned before, spiritual growth is intentional. And if you'll take time to really evaluate yourself, examination is really important. So if you'll take time to examine your own spiritual life, then this is one way to do it. There are other ways to do it. This is one, I think it's a good way to do it. Because Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. And so take time to evaluate, examine your own life in these areas and then go out and intentionally work on strengthening your strengths and to uh, sharpen your weaknesses. Now here's the thing. If you find yourself getting overwhelmed by this, then just focus on one of the four. Because sometimes when you look at all four, it can be a bit overwhelming. So if you find yourself, wow, there's just so much to change and I got so much uh, that I need to work on, then just work on one area, pick one of the four and work on one of those, okay? Now, a few, a few other things, and then we'll take a, a little break here. Uh, now it says, 
How then can we move from fragmentation to unity, from many things to one necessary thing, from our divided lives to undivided lives in the Spirit? A hard struggle is required. He's talking about spiritual formation. Okay, we live in a divided, fragmented world. We want to grow spiritually. And so we got to work on this. And he says, a hard struggle is required. It is the struggle to allow God's Spirit to work in us and recreate us. And there's two important things that now I'm saying here, and I want you to get both of them. First is, is that spiritual formation is a struggle. It's a hard struggle. It is not going to come easily. Spiritual growth, intentional spiritual growth, it, it's, a, it's a struggle because we have our worldly self and our flesh that fights back and doesn't want to change. And we have character that's been formed in us for years and years, habits that have been formed in us for years and years, and we got to fight to change. So it's a struggle. But notice also he says that God's Spirit is involved. It says God allow God's Spirit to work in us and recreate us. And that's the key. As we practice the spiritual disciplines, now, it's another important point. You've got to get this. You guys paying attention? Yeah. Everybody with me right now? Okay. It's not, the, the spiritual disciplines will not change you. God changes you. We practice the spiritual disciplines to enable the Spirit to change us. And enable God to change us. And that's really an important distinction. Because if you get in there and you leave and you think, okay, I'm just going to really focus on my Bible study and I'm going to change because of that. Well, if you're not connected with God, you don't have the right heart, then you're just going to learn knowledge. You know, you'll get more and more knowledge. But your character and your heart will not become more like Christ. We practice the spiritual disciplines to allow the Holy Spirit to change us. We practice the spiritual disciplines so God will work on us. And so... As we do this, it is a struggle, but it's a struggle worth fighting. Right. Because as we work on it, we become more like Christ. So spiritual formation is spiritual transformation. Let me give you a few verses here, a couple of verses, and we'll close out with this first session here. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness. With ever increasing glory. You get that? You see that? There's a beautiful language here. Which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 2 Amen. Corinthians 3.18 Spiritual formation is about being transformed into His likeness. That's the goal. With ever increasing glory. It's the Lord and the Spirit that really do this transforming in us. That's the goal. That's what we want. Be transformed into the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And that's spiritual formation. But it is a struggle. That's why we might lose heart if we don't keep fighting the battle. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. So we focus our eyes on God, we practice the spiritual disciplines, and God works on us. Keith Meyer in a book called The Kingdom Life, and it's a great book. I don't know if I put it on required reading or not. Um, because it's, it's rather thick and it has a number of different articles from a number of different authors. And, but if you want to pick up another book that's really good on this area of spiritual formation, this is probably in my top five right here. It's really a, really a good one, The Kingdom Life. And uh, Keith Meyer says, while it is true that apart from Christ we can do nothing, it is also true that if we do nothing, it will be apart from Christ. And I love that. Because... We, we are, we always, we practice the spiritual disciplines. We might think, well, you know, we practice these things and, and are these things going to change us? No, God's going to change us. But if you do nothing, you're doing that apart from God and apart from Christ. It all goes together. You know, we get in the word, we get into prayer, we work on these things. And as we do that, God works on us 
and he draws us deeper into his word, and deeper into worship, and deeper into service, and we change through that. Titus, Paul says in Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men and teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify uh, for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Well, look, it says here that he gave himself for us. He will redeem us from all wickedness. He will purify for himself. So it's God that does the redeeming and God that does the purifying. But it's, it's, it's us. We are the ones who say no to ungodliness. We are the ones who say, I'm going to live a self-controlled life. I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to read my Bible. Understanding that as I do that, God's going to redeem me. God's going to purify me. He's going to work on me. But I've got to make the decision that I'm going to get up when the alarm rings and I'm going to get in the Word and I'm going to be in prayer. And when I have this appointment with this brother or sister, I'm going to get with them and I'm going to open up my life so that they can work on me a bit. And when it's time to go worship God in a public assembly, I'll be there and I'll worship God in that way. Or when it's time for me to go serve and to help other people, I'll show up and I'll serve. And because I'm going to say no to ungodliness, yes to self-control. And by doing that, God is going to work on me and work on my heart. So you see how it all works together. And it all fits together. And so I, we don't approach these spiritual disciplines in you know, some legalistic fashion, thinking that they're going to change us on their own. God does the changing. The Spirit works on us. But we also have something to do in it ourselves. And so that's how it all fits together. And as we do that with this, in, this idea of intentional growth, we start to see God change our lives. I'm talking about spiritual training, spiritual formation, spiritual training. 1 Timothy 4 verse 9, train yourself to be godly. Amen. And so we get in these spiritual disciplines. And these are some of the fundamentals of spirituality. We work on them. We practice them. We build more and more skill in this area. We are intentional in them. And then through it all, God works on us and he helps us out. Amen. This is a good place to stop for this first uh, lesson. Let's take a short break, maybe a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll do right. lesson two. Come on.